I'm Mads Wilson, and I am part of a group in Copenhagen called Copenhagen Suborbitals. And as was mentioned before, we are the only, as far as I know, amateur group in the world trying to build a rocket that can actually put a man in space. And I, I enjoy every time I get to say this, because what we are doing is actually rocket science. There's nothing really disruptive about this, really, because we don't have a business plan. We are, do we are not doing this to make money. We are not really inventing any new technology. Basically, what we are doing is we are taking the technology develop developed especially by NASA in the 50s and 60s, and we are using ordinary off-the-shelf components to implement that, that technology into a rocket. And what we are trying to do is to build a rocket and a spaceship that is just good enough. Just good enough to send a man above the Kármán line, which is 100 kilometers up, and bring him down safely. We are about 50 people, and we have a workshop, as you can see here, here in the picture, with a little, the little stripe you can see in the picture is actually the International Space Station uh, moving over our workshop in Copenhagen. We are based at an uh, old shipyard uh, where we have this unheated uh, workshop where we, uh, where we build all, uh, all our stuff. Actually, and this might come as a surprise to some of you, building a rocket and launching it is not that difficult. About, it's, only a, it's only about 20% of the time and money that we spend that actually goes into building rockets. What is really difficult is the process of transporting, handling, and the infrastructure around launching the rocket. Because you cannot just launch a rocket. The best thing would be just to take it out in our backyard, set it up, fire it, and launch it. Because that it's easy, we have everything. But you cannot just launch a rocket. You need to go somewhere where there is a lot of nothing. And there are not many places, at least not in Europe, where you have a lot of nothing. So what we have to do is we have to sail uh, out to sea. We launch our rockets from international waters outside the island of Bornholm, as you can see here in the, uh, in the picture. We sail out in international waters in an old military shooting area just outside Bornholm called ESD-139. And over there, we, because it's an old military uh, exercise area, we actually have the possibility to clear the area and to clear with air traffic control in Malmö to make sure that no commercial traffic is going over this area so that we can, uh, so that we can launch our rockets. As I said before, most of the work concerning the, the launching of the rocket is going into all the surroundings, all the auxiliary things. For example, when we started this project in, uh, in 2008, one of the things we, we've, we, we've, we had to solve first before doing anything else was to build a launching platform. So we spent actually two years building our own self-propelled, self-sailing launch platform that can carry the rocket from Copenhagen to Bornholm in 24 hours so that we can launch it. But when we are out to sea, about 35 kilometers out to sea, we also need to be able to have our mission control somewhere. We need to be able to see what we are doing. So we have bought an old German rescue vessel uh, and renamed it Vostok, and that is our mission control ship. A lot of effort and a lot of money has also gone into actually equipping and maintaining that, that ship. So th those are our two main uh, vessels, as you can see here. This is a picture from our launch in 2011, where we launched uh, partly successfully the biggest amateur-built rocket in the world uh, so far. This uh, rocket was called Heat 1X, and it was a hybrid rocket, which means that it had a, uh, a solid fuel grain and the, the oxidizer was, uh, was liquid oxygen. And there was actually a space capsule on top of this called uh, Tycho Brahe, named uh, from the Danish uh, astronomer. And the idea, the first idea we had, again, because as I said before, we wanted to build something as simple as possible, to the simplest possible solution to get a man in space. The idea was that the, the astronaut should be standing up in the capsule like this, because when you have this posture, you can actually fit into a tube that is quite small. Uh, the rocket is 65 centimeters in diameter, and you can see uh, on the top there's a little dome where the astronaut could look out. 
Uh, here you can see the, the actual launch. We learned a lot from this. We learned, for example, that this, that this is not the way to do it. Uh, based on the measurements we took and f the, the g-forces and everything, we killed the astronaut three times during this launch. We killed him going up. We killed him on separation, where the capsule separated from the, uh, from the rocket. And we also killed him on impact. And I will get back to that a little bit later, why, why it is uh, so difficult and why we have taken a, a different path now. Another thing we learned from this launch was that it is not just enough to build a passively stable rocket. A passively stable rocket means a rocket that just has fins, and it's the aerodynamics that makes it, makes it go straight up. This rocket actually only flew up to a height of about three kilometers, and then it flew eight kilometers sideways. And that was just because it was a little bit, a little bit banana shaped, just, just a tiny bit, maybe five millimeters or something. But that is actually enough, uh, enough to make that rocket go, uh, go out of course. So we very, very, uh, we very soon realized that we needed to have some sort of guidance system. We simply need, needed to build our own guidance system to, make, to, to, to be able to make the rocket go straight up. So uh, we did a lot of tests with that. And the next rocket that we, uh, we, we built was not supposed to go into space, uh, sorry, not supposed to carry a man, but it was supposed to go into space. It was a rocket uh, uh, roughly the same size. It had a liquid, uh, liquid fuel engine on that, that burned alcohol and, uh, and liquid oxygen, and we built everything. And then in the autumn of 2014, we uh, were to do a static test of that rocket. When we are launching these rockets on water, a lot of a lot of a lot of different things needs to happen. One thing that needs to happen is we need to transfer a lot of people back and forth between the different ships, because about 25 people are involved in the operation, and they need to be on the platform sometimes, on the mission control ship sometimes, and sometimes they need to go onto the other vessels. And that is actually some of the complexity of this mission is that we need to transfer people all the time. Also, as you can see, we need to have the mission control on our, our, our control ship. And that means wires and computers and stuff just on a boat out in the middle of the sea. And this is, this is a, a actually a quite difficult uh, operation. As I said before, what we are trying to do when we are building these rockets is we are trying to use ordinary components to make it. When you look at this picture, this, m this l it, it, looks, it looks complicated, doesn't it? It looks, it looks, looks spacey. What you're seeing is actually wires wrapped in ordinary uh, rescue blankets, you know, the stuff that you use when people are chilled. Inside of those are the same kind of fabric you, make for, uh, you use for making uh, little girls' uh, princess dresses because that turned out to be a, a fantastic insulation material to keep the wires from getting too cold when they were exposed to liquid oxygen. The big uh, black cables you can see is actually the right side braking cable of a Fiat Ducato. It just happened that that cable was perfectly fitted to control the two main valves in the rocket. So as the rocket was standing here, this was supposed to be our next flight. This is very, very nice hot summer day in 2014 when we were going to do an all-up test of the Heat 2X rocket that were supposed to go into space. And we did. But as you can see, uh, it didn't really go as, uh, as expected. When you ignite a rocket engine, you need to do it in two steps. You need to do what is called a pre-stage, where you open the valves a little bit to make the fire burning in the, uh, in the engine. And after that, you open the main valves to get the full throttle uh, on the engine. As you can see here, this is, this is full throttle. What happened about half a second after full throttle was that the engine ruptured. So that 600 liters of fuel spilled out in about two seconds. And that was fed by pure oxygen. So everything on that platform burned. This GoPro camera strapped about a meter from the rocket was held by two cable ties. Now the cable ties melted and the camera started to spin. And the only reason why this camera actually survived 
is because the cable ties melted and it landed down in the flame pit afterwards. This, uh, this gave us a few new cameras from GoPro because they were very, very excited that their cameras were actually able to, uh, to survive the inferno of, uh, of a rocket engine. But needless to say, after this test, uh, we were a little bit, um, we were a little, little bit disappointed. It was apparent that we needed to go to go back and, and look at things uh, from a different angle because because uh, this uh, this uh, didn't really work. As I said before, this is all about doing it the simplest way. It is all all about getting a person up there and getting him down again alive. And what is most difficult about that is actually the, f the, the the human body because the human body is quite fragile the human body cannot withstand the, the g-forces at least not in, in in certain positions and as it turned out the worst possible way that you can you can put g-forces on your on your body is actually standing up and being accelerated this way on the rocket on the heat 1x rocket uh, it would have felt like uh, sitting on a jackhammer as you can see, this is the camera from the pilot's point of view in the Heat 2X rocket. And in a minute when it launches, you can clearly see why this would have been a very, very bad experience for the, uh, for the astronaut. He would simply have uh, broken his back several times just, just going up there. In a minute, the capsule will separate and start falling, uh, start falling to the earth or to the water. Uh, and that separation itself, itself also uh, keeps the capsule spinning and, 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 and it's, it's, a, it's a very, very, uh, a very nasty ride. So after that, we kind of started looking into, okay, if the person cannot be standing up, then we need, to, we need to have a different approach. The best approach you can take when you launch an astronaut is to use a position where the astronaut is on his back. And that is because the human body can take a lot of T-forces this, this way and it can take a lot of g-forces this way, but on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, the vertical axis, it is th that's, that's not good. When you're standing like this and being accelerated up, all the blood will just go into your legs, and you will actually die quite, uh, quite fast. The problem is, if you want to have the astronaut in a position where he's lying down, then you need to have a quite big capsule, which means that you need to have a quite bit big rocket. So we did some experiments uh, on that to, um, to find out uh, what, what, what we could actually do, what, what, what was the best dimension uh, we could do on the capsule. And we experimented with a capsule that was about 1.8 meter in diameter. And that worked beautifully. It, it, it made a, a, very good, uh, a very good capsule, but it turned out to be way too big. So the next thing we looked into was, okay, how can we do this? What, what is an acceptable way? How can we fit an astronaut into a very tiny space and launching him and not killing him? And the best way to do that is actually, as you see there, to put the astronaut in a cannonball position. Because it is all about having your extremities, your arms and leg as close to your body as possible so that the blood stays in your heart. When you're sitting like that, the human body can actually, can actually withstand quite a lot of, uh, of G-forces. Up and down is not good. Side to side is not good either, but if you're sitting down in a cannonball position, then, then, then it is you, it, it, the trip will actually be survivable, even if you are loaded with, uh, with four Gs going up and about eight Gs going down. As you can see, we have, uh, we have built quite a few rockets uh, to date. Uh, this uh, image illustrates some of the capsules we have built, and you can see the rocket in the middle is the, the speaker rocket the one that we are aiming for, uh, and this will be the manned mission. This is what we are, we are working on and developing at the moment. This will be the rocket that will uh, put a, a human uh, into space. As you can see here, this is, uh, this is the, the Tuco 2 capsule, Tuco, Tuco 2 capsule that, we, uh, that we designed with the astronaut on, uh, on his back that got way too big, so, so the concept now is to make a very small capsule, about one meter in diameter, where the astronaut can sit in a, in a cannonball position. And the ride itself uh, will be fairly unpleasant. The rocket, uh, the speaker rocket, will be about 15 meters tall and weigh about four tons. Uh, about uh, three of those tons will be propellants. 
And the rocket engine that will uh, propel this rocket will have a thrust of, of uh, 100 kilonewtons. That is the equivalent of, of 10 tons of thrust. And that will accelerate the astronaut from 0 to 3.5 times the speed of sound in about 90 seconds. And at 90 sec in, in 19 seconds, we will reach an altitude of about 50 kilometers. And at 50 kilometers, the main engine will cut off, and that will feel like being kicked in the not-so-pleasant place by a horse, because the engine stops accelerating. But the rocket will have so much, have picked up so much speed that it will continue another 50 or 60 kilometers and go past the Kármán line 100 kilometers up. And this is where the really fun part begins, because from Earth to the time where we stop the engine, we can actually control the rocket. We can control how it moves and where it flies. Once the engine cuts off, we can't really control anything, but it doesn't really matter because the rocket is going so fast that it will just continue on a straight trajectory towards space. But once the, the Earth's uh, gravitational pull gets hold of the rocket and we separate the capsule from the booster, then it's wha that, that's when the problems start kicking in because then we are actually in a free fall, which means that the astronaut will experience uh, zero gravity and the capsule will just start spinning as it falls towards the Earth. And all the energy we have built up by putting the rocket up there, all that potential energy, it needs to go somewhere. And the only way that energy can go is either heat or wind resistant. And and as you know, the atmosphere is very, very thin up at uh, 100 kilometers. It actually just starts being a little bit dense uh, at, at 60 kilometers, which means that once the spaceship hits the atmosphere, we cannot really put out a parachute because there's nothing there. There's nothing that the parachute can grab hold to. So the only thing we can do is to make sure that we try to align the capsule with the heat shield down, and then the air resistance will break the capsule for the first part of the ride, and once the atmosphere gets dense enough, then we can apply uh, a, small, uh, a small parachute. Imagine how this flight will go just from the beginning. You are sitting on a platform 35 kilometers out to sea in the Baltic Ocean. The platform is moving slightly. We, we, can, we can take waves up, up to about half a meter or something. But you will be sitting 15 meters up in a tower in a tin can in the summer sun waiting while, while all the rest of us are running down like madmen and trying to connect the, the correct wires and fix all the problems because we fire this before we, we, we fire this engine. Uh, that can actually kill the astronaut just, just sitting there. He can get a heat stroke. So we need to have some sort of environmental system in the capsule that can, ke that can uh, keep him cool. Then when the engine kicks in, he will be accelerated and then after the flight is done, he will start falling towards Earth. Once the capsule hits the atmosphere, as I told you before, it's very important that we get it to point the heat shield downwards. And one way you can do that is to apply a, a, a small thing called a balut, which is actually a small parachute. It is not really a parachute, but it is a small, uh, a small uh, contraption made of the, of the same material as, uh, as, uh, as uh, parachutes. And its only purpose is to create a little bit of drag in the atmosphere so that the capsule turns the right way. And then once the astronaut has moved th uh, towards the atmosphere, through the atmosphere, and we hopefully got the parachute out, then comes the most dangerous part of the entire mission. And that is when the astronaut actually lands in the water and is waiting to be picked up. Because the capsule will only be one meter by two meters, but it can easily be dragged 100 kilometers away from the launch site, easily. And to find such a small object out in the ocean is very difficult but it's even more difficult to actually get there in time with our rescue boats to pick him up. So even, even though it sounds totally crazy, once he is down and lying in the water, that is actually the most difficult part of the, or dangerous part of the entire mission. This is where it is most likely that we will actually kill him. 
when he's lying down there. <laughs> As you can see here, this is the this is the Tycho One uh, capsule uh, lying in the water, and uh, and the uh, the speaker capsule will be, will be about uh, three times the size. But it's a very very small very very small object. Before we get to the uh, to the actual speaker mission, one of the things we learned uh, in the fire of Heat Two X was that we needed to build smaller rockets to test all the subsystems because all the computer systems all the all the all the different uh, telemetry systems all the mechanisms of the big rocket can be tested in a smaller rocket because they are exactly the same so what we have done is we have actually developed an uh, ikea version of a, of a rocket what you see here is actually a full all the components needed for a rocket uh, that is uh, about five meters tall and 30 centimeters in diameter and this rocket is able to fly to about eight or ten kilometers there are almost no weldings here everything is just put together with with uh, with the screws or rivets and this can all be laser cut so we can just send the send the uh, the laser the cutting files to uh, to uh, to uh, a subcontractor and we can get a complete rocket kit within a week and start building the the rocket and it will uh, it will go uh, and and look something like this this is the uh, the next year rocket the next year model rocket we will actually do the first launch of the next year rocket in uh, in about a month in july we will test it and all the systems on the next year rocket is exactly they are exactly the same as the ones that we will be flying on the speaker here you can see the next year rocket uh, lying in the workshop there are one thing missing though the most important thing of a rocket and that is the rocket engine of course we needed to develop a very stable and very reliable rocket engine also as a test bed and we did that by uh, again looking back at old NASA technology and we have reverse engineered uh, an old, uh, old NASA engine called LR 101 that was actually one of the guidance uh, guidance engines on the old Atlas uh, intercontinent yeah the old Atlas ballistic missile really we have we have taken one of those engines and and reverse engineered to ma uh, and we have made this engine called BPM 5 which will be the um, the main engine for the next year rockets this engine has been tested intensely we have done over 50 test runs of the engine and it is very very rocket and can and can withstand almost anything what you see here is a test we did where we tried to find out what materials would be best for the jet veins jet veins are the small fins that that you put into the slipstream of the engine that actually controls the position of the uh, of the rocket and as you saw on the film uh, copper was not a good idea the green flame you could see was actually copper burning it didn't just melt it actually burned in the flame because the flame is uh, is uh, about uh, 2600 degrees hot what comes out of of the um, of the rocket engine the next flight is quite simple the only thing we need to do we need to get it up we need to release the parachute and we need to get the components down and during this flight we also need to test uh, that all the radio systems systems and all the computers and all the fail safe system works so it is actually very very simple the rocket will only go up to six kilometers and uh, and we will repeat this test until until we have a perfect flight and then we will move on to uh, to build the the speaker rocket one thing we haven't had much luck with so far is uh, parachutes none of the rockets we have built to date has actually come down in a parachute either the parachute hasn't been released or there has been a problem with the parachutes uh, one of the problems is that we need to build up the parachutes ourselves because when you build a parachute you need to have a parachute that is exactly the correct dimensions for the amount of weight that you are that you are uh, you are sending down to uh, in the in the atmosphere and danish regulations says that if you are going to test the parachute that you have built yourself then you can only do it with a man it, uh, it's not legal to drop out uh, a bag of potatoes or something to test the parachute it needs to be a man test so uh, we have uh, we have uh, this uh, guy uh, Ahmed who's a parachute instructor and he actually does all the testing he simply jumps out of planes 
with the parachutes that we have sewn ourselves. And then once he have tested it, he releases it and then he lands in his own, uh, in his own parachute. So as you can see, in, in, in again, this is an example of there are so many things surrounding the actual rocket, the actual rocket science. The fire and the engines and everything is actually a very, very small portion of, uh, of the uh, entire project. I'm very sad. It, it was actually meant that we should have launched the next year rocket last year. We had some technical problems, so we, so we, didn't, um, we didn't get to it. But we got this fine little greeting from the first Danish astronaut that went to the International Space Station. He actually, uh, he actually printed this uh, on, the, uh, on the color printer on the space station and sent us this uh, via Twitter uh, on the day that we were supposed to, uh, to launch the, the rocket. But hopefully we will, uh, we will uh, get the rocket in the air uh, within a month, a month or so. And a lot of people have asked me over the years, why do you do this? Because there's no apparent reason, there's no business, there's nothing in it. Why do you want to go to space? And the best answer I can give is really because it's there. Thank you. So Mads, I'm really curious actually who these volunteers, who these amateurs are who participate in Copenhagen Suborbitals. So what kind of backgrounds do they come from? We have all different kinds of backgrounds. We have actually some professional rocket scientists but we are a group of physicists, engineers, mechanics, me metal workers. We have a kindergarten teacher. So very, very different so all backgrounds. all kinds of people. Yeah. All right, fantastic. Yeah. Thanks.